Hey, thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. We have prayed that you'd be blessed by it. Uh, we want you to know, too, we believe that this is really supplemental uh, to your, your experience in the life of a local church. But if you're here in the Dallas area, we hope you'll come and join us and be with us for worship. We pray this blesses your life and you're drawn closer to Christ as a result of this message. If you wonder if it's worth the risk for a church to decide whether or not we're going to reach outsiders or just close and finally implode on the inside because we're not about the main thing that Christ has called us to. If you want to know if Jim's life made a difference, you probably ought to ask the hundreds upon thousands upon thousands of people in China who came to Christ through the life of James Hudson Taylor. He founded the Chinese Inland Mission more than a century ago. And the revival that has taken place across this nation and is continuing today. Many argue that over the past 50 years, the great revival in the world has taken place in China. And many who were directly impacted by his life or indirectly would say that it all started when Hudson Taylor decided to leave the comforts of his Christian life. And go into a place where nobody knew Christ. And God used him mightily. Now, I share that story. Many of us think, well, I'm not, I'm not Hudson Taylor. I'm not going to, sh- I mean, Jeff, good look. I'm not shaving my head. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. But let me ask you, what is God calling you to do? And so I'm going to be, uh, this, is, this is family talk, okay? Every now and then at the Warren House, we get, you know, a family meeting. Let's get everybody together, right? When the kids are growing up, all right, we we got to let's come together. We got to talk. And today I want to talk to our church family. Now, if you're a guest, or if you don't know Christ and you're still on that journey, we're so glad you're here. This is a safe place to ask a lot of tough questions. And we're all on a journey. Um, but every believer here, I want to challenge you. And so we've been walking through. I want you to turn to uh, Colossians. Why don't you do that now? Turn to Colossians chapter 2 as we've been walking through this series of messages again. Uh, no, Colossians 4. Let's go there. Colossians 4. Because we're going to be um, looking at verse 2, actually. We've been looking at verses 5 and 6. And uh, what I'm going to do today is back up a little bit. We've been talking about the different styles of evangelism, we've called them. Because you have been, you've been wired a certain way. The thought is that many of us were like, man, I'm not, I'm not Hudson Taylor. I'm not Billy Graham or somebody who, you know, I, I can't do that. Or I, I don't want to be the televangelist guy. He's creepy. And so I'm... I'm not an evangelist. That's where we come, ultimately. We, we land like, I'm not that. I want to be that, but I'm not. I, I don't. We land in the middle and we think, I'm not. So I'm not an evangelist. Somebody, you know, is going to share the gospel. But let, let me ask you, who is going to share the gospel with friends that you have who do not know Jesus? You may be the only Jesus, the spirit in you, that they will ever meet and ever have an opportunity to hear the gospel. And so today we're continuing to challenge you here as we move in then next week towards our Easter series of messages. Uh, this is going to be a lot of fun as we look at the seven cries from the cross. And we're going to be walking through that starting, by the way, this Wednesday night in this room. Come as you'll hear more about that very creative time, six o'clock. So mark your calendars. Some of you have to leave early from work, perhaps to be here. But come be here at six. It's going to set the, you know, the direction and the tone for your Easter season. It's going to be an awesome time. Right here this Wednesday night, Ash Wednesday, in fact. Okay, so Colossians chapter 4, verse 5, it says this, Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. So there are those who are outsiders, those who have not yet received Christ, and, 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 and he's called us to, to, to reach out. Now, these are the words of Paul to the church that echo forth from us. We're called to be wise, always being aware. Uh, I've said it this way, you've never locked eyes with someone. For whom Jesus did not die. Every person you know. And some of you have family or friends or people that you you know who do not yet know Jesus. And then he goes on Colossians 4 verse 6 says, Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So look at this. We're to be gracious uh, and, and and there's speech. Okay, so there's something to be said. We've said the gospel is news. 
The news needs a newscaster. So we are to love out loud is what we've been saying again, right? So when we speak with others, look at this. Our lives, we're to be, uh, our speech is to be seasoned with salt. So we're to have this, this flavor, if you will. And we've said that every one of you have a unique seasoning. All of us have a unique seasoning to bring. You stand out uniquely. It's how God has called you and how he's created you, okay? So we've been asking this question. What is your uh, evangelism style? Now, uh, now evangelism, not a, it's not a program. I know it sounds that way. But what we try to do is set you free to see that you too are an evangelist. All of us who have received the good news are good news tellers. And God has placed you in places and people. He's in, you're in that house and your neighbors. You're in that job with your coworkers. You're in that classroom with your classmates. You are in that place by God's design. And he wants you to be the one who would, who would help bring them one step closer, perhaps share the gospel with them to reach them. So we've said, what's your style? And we've given you an opportunity to go, all of our members know this, um, to go online. We've got a little quiz, doesn't take long. If you've not yet done that, do it, and it'll reveal what your style is, if you will. Okay. So the six styles that we looked at are, first of all, is uh, we said the direct style. All right. We said that you know, like a, a Billy Graham from you know, a, a maybe a former generation type who's real clear, very loving, very direct. Some some might say Tim Tebow's kind of that way. You know, think of some athletes, uh, Chance the Rapper. All right, who's um, really bold, right? And uh, a young guy, I mean, growing, I think, in his faith. He's you know, still growing, but, but he's bold. And, and, and people are hearing the gospel um, and, and coming to understand more of God's love for them because of him. So we've watched that. Uh, we've talked about the intellectual style. Uh, we're, uh, you know, an apologist, someone who answers tough questions of faith, like uh, N.T. Wright. Tim Keller comes to mind these days. Um, William Craig Lane is another one. Uh, we've talked about the testimonial style. Um, and uh, Josh McDowell, who's going to be here uh, on May the 5th and, and that weekend, I think the 7th perhaps is the Sunday. But he has an incredible story. Um, a former atheist who is now uh, one who, who defends the faith, written a lot of books and such. So he's going to come be with us. But a lot of us have, have stories. We've said that, you know, some people uh, like me, maybe I was... Talking to Alex, who read scripture earlier, was that awesome or what? Uh, he came to Christ, he's nine years old, just came to Christ last week. Um, God's using him to testify to his goodness. And um, I was nine when I, when I came to Christ. I'm curious, how many were children when you came to faith in Christ? Yeah, I was baptized at that time. And, and you know, I've grown a lot to understand more clearly through those teenage years. And, and as an adult, still learning and growing to understand the, um, the boundless gospel that we can't get enough of. We can't fully understand it. We can't scrutinize it enough. We can't, under, we can't grasp it enough. And so it's a lifetime journey. But for me, like a lot of you, um, I could say, well, you know, I came to Christ when I was a kid. You know, I, I wasn't in you know, prison at eight. And then, you know, the, the drug problem really when I was about eight and a half. And, you know, I didn't have, I didn't have like this dramatic story. And yet, uh, when I think of how, how the Lord brought me from death to life, I mean, that's, that's a dramatic story. We've said it's not our story, it's his story. And, and so um, we've seen testimonies today through baptism. And we're going to do more. We have more baptisms the late hour. Uh, I was with candidates the mor this morning. I always tell them, you're going to preach a better sermon than I will. Um, last week I baptized a man. His name is John Jones. John came to our church just a couple of months ago, probably not, not more than that. And um, he's 70 years old. And he came to faith in Christ. And I, and I baptized him last week. And he, I mean, to just talk to him now, he'll tell you that his life has completely changed. His desires have changed. It's blowing him away. And he's, he, said, he sat in my office, you know, a few weeks ago, and he said, Jeff, tell me, tell me this, tell me this won't fade away. Like, please, tell me this is like for real. And I said, man, it is for real. It is real. And he's telling everybody that he can. What Christ has done in his life. So there's this testimonial kind of a style. Um, we've talked about interpersonal. You know, those who are just really loving and, and have, maybe have lots of friends, maybe not. Maybe you feel like, man, I'm not an extrovert, so I'm not an evangelist. No, 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 no. I, I, you know, introverts, as we've talked about a lot, are, are the better listeners. And the greatest way to express your faith and to share Christ is to listen. Nobody's listening nowadays. 
And so we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But that's, that's a powerful one. And then invitational and serving. Those are the two final two that we're going to talk about today. And, you know, they're pretty simple. I mean, by the, by the name we've given them. Now, uh, last week, I got, a, I got a text from a friend who, um, who, who wrote this to me. He says this, and some of y'all know uh, one of our members. His name is Russ. He told me he was um, so encouraged by the message and reminded, uh, he was reminded of the power of just listening. Okay, so listen to this. This is great. Uh, Listening to people as we enter into conversations about faith. So he's, uh, Russ is a teacher, and he has a Moroccan exchange student who comes to talk to him after school. He said, he said this, for some reason I've found favor in his eyes. And I'm guessing because Russ just loving him, just loves him for free. And this guy is not even in his class. He comes by, his name's Sufain. He comes by his class after school to talk. He's Muslim, so we talk about faith. I was reminded to really listen to his story about his faith. The verses in Colossians 4, 5, and 6, which we have looked at and are looking at this month, that you spoke on were particularly relevant, but the Lord kept reminding me to look at what preceded those words in verses 2 through 4. Now, little did he know, and I told him later, that we're, that's what we're going to talk about this week. And pretty awesome. He reminded me that all of verses 5 and 6 should be preceded by prayer. Okay, we'll get there to that in a second. That's what he says in verse 2 through 4. Bringing it all to him. I'm, I'm so often busy doing. And I was reminded all week by the Spirit that apart from me, you can do nothing. I'm useless on my own. The last while I've been studying about the Muslim faith, doing lots of reading to remind myself of the background But it was a reminder uh, last Sunday to listen that really hit me. Sylvain isn't concerned with how much I know about about Islam. He wants to know how much I care for him. Not that it's bad to learn, but, uh, but he says, I forgot really my focus. My focus is to point him to Christ. And the best way is to be slow to speak, quick to listen, and even quicker to love him through Christ. Thanks for the reminder. Interestingly, so we we can back and forth a little bit. And then he said, interestingly, Sufain brought a friend of his to talk Friday. He's a German exchange student who said he was an atheist. (laughs) And then Russ finishes by saying, God is good all the time. You see, gang, it's just a function of just loving people well and entering into the conversation And uh, I just want us to be reminded that we can all share. And one of the best ways to share nowadays is to listen because people will tell their stories and just ask the right questions. I'm curious, you know, tell me more about your spiritual journey. I'm curious. Tell me more about what what you believe and just listen. So the last two, the invitational style. The example is the woman at the well in John chapter 9. You may remember that story, the Samaritan. And she's there and and, and she, you know, Jesus gets her by a few questions, ask her, uh, hey, tell, tell me more. She's telling her story. And, and she, she then enter, in, enters into conversation with him. And she t- he talks about this um, never ending, you know, spring, this well that will come up in, in her, this new life. And she realizes that he's the Messiah. And what's so interesting is that she then goes back to her non-Christian friends. This is a whole, you know, different sermon. But sometimes, listen. The Lord will will change your life, not to pull you out. In fact, most of the time, not to pull you away from your non-believing friends or your former, you know, non-Christian friends. He will leave you right there. So he sends her back to Sychar, where she's from, and a revival broke out. Because they're going, wait, wait, wait. We know her. Now we see her on the other side. And, and, and it was an incredible time as, as, as the Lord used her in Sychar. So here's kind of the key verse for you. If you're more of an invitation, you like to invite people in to come. Uh, Luke 14, 23. And the master said to the servant, go out in the highways and hedges and compel people to come in that my house may be full. So you may be filled. So see, the Lord's given us a chance to invite people come to, uh, to our connect group. You know, we're seeing a lot of people who would come maybe to a smaller group. Maybe it's a Bible study you're in, always looking for others who are not yet a part. Here's another example. I love this. Philip, it says in John 1, 
Philip found Nathanael. So this is early on. These are the disciples. He found his brother. And he said to him, We have found him who, of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth. He's the son of Joseph. We found him. And so the key phrase here is, is, is simple. Come and see. Come and see. You know, you, we're inviting people. Come, come. And so we've said even this Easter season, we're praying for, for one person uh, for one minute at one o'clock every day. We're praying the Lord would open our hearts. Listen, I was in a conversation earlier today. You want to get in the game? You start praying for the Lord to open doors for you to share the gospel. It'll happen. And as you pray for people, God gives you a greater heart for them. And so we're challenging you, all of us, to invite people to come. And maybe it's Easter Sunday. You know, if you're, you really have someone who's may, maybe very difficult to invite to come, that's the day when people come to church. They'll do it. They'll come on that day. So be targeting people that you love and invite them to come. So serving style is the next. Dorcas is the example in Acts 9, verse 36. Again, just real practical teaching throughout this month. It says that, that she was a disciple in Joppa. And it says this. In Acts 9, 36, she was full of good works and acts of charity. She was always doing good and serving others' needs. Isn't that great? And the Lord just would open doors for her to share the gospel. I think of people in our church. I could name a lot of people who simply their style, if you will, is just serving others. And we often you know, highlight people who lead ministries like, a, like a Terry Hurd or Bob Herrera, who's here, who serves in our alms ministry. Um, Jana Gardner, who, who leads ministries over in the Vickery area, and is just serving people. I met just a couple of weeks ago a guy named Todd Phillips. Uh, he works with one of our members, Ryan, uh, too, some of you know, and uh, he's recently joined this ministry. It's called Last Well. And he had this fascinating story. He told me, Jeff, I was with a group of uh, millennials, really a young, young adult group, and we all were really um, Moved by the film that came out some years ago. You remember uh, as Amazing Grace, wasn't it? With the Wilberforce, the story uh, of William Wilberforce and the abolition of slavery in, in Great Britain. So this group was really touched and moved by that. And they started to ask the question, hey, what, what could we end in our generation? Kind of a bold you know, question. And so through some uh, connections and ministry opportunities they had, they decided they, the Lord placed on their hearts uh, Liberia, the country of Liberia. And so they determined by 2020, uh, this ministry was designed to, they, they looked and they said, what's the greatest need in Liberia? Because from that need, whatever it is, we're going to meet the need and we're going to share the gospel. And what they decided to do was, we're going to provide water. That was the greatest need, is the greatest need in Liberia. From border to border across the entire country, by 2020, every person in Liberia is going to have access to water. And while we do it, one village at a time, through wells that are being dug, uh, through filtering systems that they can give to people, we're going to share the gospel. And we're going to partner with local believers so they seek to meet a need, all in hopes of sharing the gospel. And it's happening. It's incredible what's going on. Now, again, we, we offer examples like that. Or, gosh, Buckner International is another. Their, you know, their first step in is to meet needs in places where we partner with them. Like in South Texas, some of you uh, have been to South Texas and served uh, in our areas there, but, but Buckner's, you know, big partner there with us. Stacy and I are going with a group of young adults, young couples who are heading out uh, in June and love for you to all come and join us as we go and share the gospel. But, but ministries like Buckner, it's, it's all about meeting a need, but not, not to leave it there, but to love out loud to share the gospel. And so all of us can do this. What's your thing? What need, how about this, might your one friend or neighbor have and you could meet that need, not to, you know, not to be all strategizing and sneaky, but because you love them. But look for needs. I remember years ago, um, I, was, I was cutting my grass. I was mowing the lawn. And uh, the Lord prompted me. Uh, I'm out there, it's summertime, and I'm feeling good because I'm like king mower, you know, and I'm mowing the grass. It's looking good. And, but I, I, I realized my neighbor's yard was kind of high. And I was like, you know, he keeps his grass cut. And I thought, man, I don't know if he's out of town or something. But the Lord just prompted me to just keep going right across my driveway and keep going over into his yard. 
Now I thought, man, I could just keep going down the block, but I thought, no, that's going to be too hard. So, so I, went, I went across, and I started to cut his grass. I was like, I'm pretty much finished with mine. Um, and no, for a while, yeah, I was just going right across the driveway. And then, so I finished up, uh, or got close, and, and before I was done, and it wasn't like a big yard or anything, and, and uh, he comes out of his front porch. He comes out on the porch, and he's waving his arm like, you know, kind of like, what are you doing? You know, um, come on, you know. And so I turn off the mower, and I realize he has, he's got a crutch, and his foot is in a boot. I had no idea. And I was like, what, what, what's up with you? What happened? You know, his first says, oh, what are you doing, man? I said, I'm, I'm just cutting grass, feeling good, man, feeling strong, you know. Um, <laughs> just cutting your grass. I thought, I don't know, I was prompted to cut it. And look at you. And he says, man, I mean, he was kind of blown away. And, of course, he knew, you know, you know everybody knows I'm a preacher, you know, in the neighborhood and such. And, <laughs> and, um, and so just able to just, just love a neighbor for free, right? You see that your neighbors have needs, and you know people that you work with who have needs. I wonder if you're really taking steps of faith to reach out and just love people first by meeting a need that they have. You know, the great verse, I think, for this style, if you will, is Matthew 5, 16. You know it in the same way. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. So we point people to Jesus. Now, if it's, you know, the invitational style is kind of come and see, um, this one would be, hey, simply, you know, what can I do for you? How can I serve you? Or even better, you're prompted by the Spirit without asking the question. And you just serve. That is grace, to love people and to meet a need. So here's where we are. We're going to back up from, uh, from verses 4 uh, or 5 and 6, where we've been for most of the month. And look at what it says just prior to this in, in Colossians 4, verses 2 through uh, 3, the first part of 3. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us. So Paul, listen, he's writing from prison and, and he, he's not praying for the doors of the prison to be open. That's what I'd be praying. Get me out of here, right? He's not praying that. I know he's longing to be out of prison, but instead he prays for a door of opportunity to share the gospel with people, even while he's in chains. And so regardless of your situation, like Paul, you may feel that you're kind of shackled. You don't know exactly what to say. You might feel, feel fearful or, 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 you know, I don't know how to share the gospel. Listen, you just got to love. You got to pray, as Russ reminded us. It's the Spirit's work in your life. Are you praying for lost people? Probably a good time for you to just write down some names. I've been teaching a class on Wednesday nights, and that's what we've been doing. We've been just, you know, kind of having our people that we're praying for, an impact list of people that God's laid on our hearts. Who is God laying on your heart? Imagine if hundreds of us in this room right now were to go out into, uh, into the city this week praying for the Spirit to move in our hearts and praying for Him to move in the hearts of people we know. Imagine what would happen if thousands of people from our church today just said, I'm going to pray. That's, that's what I'm going to do first is pray. And then I'm going to love. And I'm going to watch and see what God would do. Lee Strobel asked the question at a, a recent conference we had here. And, and it just blew me away. He said this. It's a question for you. If Jesus were to come to you right now and say, I will answer every prayer that you prayed last week for a lost person. How many people would be heaven bound now as a result of your prayers? Because the Spirit is the one doing the work, right? And He's going to use you with opportunities. So as I close, here it is. Here, here's our prayer to share, all right? We're calling it. The prayer to share is twofold. First, it's opportunity. This is what Paul's teaching us. The door of opportunity. So Colossians 4, 3, the latter part of that, that God may open to us a door for the Word to declare, look at this, the mystery of Christ on account of which I'm in prison. So he says, I want him to open a door. So it's a door of opportunity. And then secondly, it's clarity. All right, the prayer is for opportunity. The prayer is for clarity. Look at what he says. That I may make it clear in verse 4, which is how I ought to speak. All right, 
So if you're struggling to make it clear with someone or you don't know what to say, be reminded of the verses we looked at in the series prior to this one. In the Upper Room Discourse, Jesus says this in John 15. He says, but when the Spirit or the Helper comes, the Holy Spirit, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. Check that out. He will bear witness. This mystery of the gospel. He will do the work and you also will bear witness. Right? So here's a word for someone here today. Don't give up. Don't give up. If you have family members that you've known for a while or friends that you think are so far from God, you know what happens? And I've seen it so many times. I've got so many stories, even from this week, of people who've been praying for years for people. And it always looks like Satan's going to win. It always looks like that person's not going to come to Christ after so many years until they do. And I just want to offer this word to you personally. It always looks like God's never going to come through for you. Often it seems like you have no hope and you're, you're never going to overcome this struggle that you have. Or you're never going to see freedom from sin or you're not going to see this breakthrough in your life that you're longing for. Maybe it's a relational challenge. Maybe it's something you're praying for now. It always looks like it's not going to happen right up until the time that it does. You know, on Friday, all of Jesus' friends said, this is the worst thing that could have happened. And then on Sunday, the resurrected Savior appeared. And they said, this is the best thing that could have ever happened. And the Lord's at work in your life. Don't ever give up. Keep on fighting the good fight and love others out loud. And may our consistent prayer be always, as we close our time, what is God saying to you? What are you going to do? How will you obey this message you've heard today? And whom will you tell? So I want to encourage you again. Let's think of people we can pray for. Uh, one, one person that God would lay on your heart for one minute at one o'clock every single day as we walk through this Easter season. Okay? So I want to close our time in prayer. We're going to sing together and just devote our, our times to him. We're going to carry his name into our week ahead. But I want us to close in prayer, all right? Would you bow your heads and just close your eyes with me? Lord, I ask that you would um, just touch every heart here. I know you've been speaking, Lord, in ways that I do not know fully. Your spirit has been touching our hearts. Uh, God, I thank you for how you do that. I thank you that you have, have given us a love for people that we would not have otherwise. But help us to love people so much that we would love out loud. That we would be bold enough to point them to you, not to ourselves. But we'd risk risk it all. And just like Hudson Taylor, in our lives, right where we are, that we would do whatever it takes, what Paul said, by all means necessary, that we might reach one for you.